When we look at protein synthesis, <clears throat> we want to know the who, the what, the when, the where, but also the why. And one of the big reasons for the why of protein synthesis is that the cell has a need for a specific protein. So not every cell is going to make every protein, and not every protein is made by every cell, we actually see a really high level of regulation, meaning control over which proteins are made, which genes are expressed. So gene regulation is actually controlling which genes are expressed, and this is going to mean transcription and translation. So when we talk about gene regulation, we're talking about controlling the steps of protein synthesis, controlling transcription, controlling translation. So when we look at whether a gene is used, so in this diagram here, you're seeing a cell, you're seeing a nucleus, you're seeing the DNA. And what you're seeing come into the cell are things like hormones and drugs and nutrition, and we also actually have things like lipoproteins and hormones. And so these things are all going to be influencing the cell. So because we have a dynamic environment, because cells are going to be experiencing environment, because cells are experiencing a changing environment, they need to be able to respond. And one of the ways they respond is by making proteins in response. So a really good example is with insulin. Insulin is made upon demand by the body when the blood sugar levels rise. Then the pancreatic cells will make insulin. The beta cells of the pancreas will make insulin. So it's only a specific part of your body that makes insulin and only in, in response to rising blood sugar levels. So this idea of a dynamic environment, both internal and external. And so how does the cell know if the environment is changing on the outside or even on the inside? And this is where those ideas of chemical messengers really come into play. So hormones are big in that we know those are chemical messengers. But drugs, nutrition, all of these are things that can convey some sort of signal. So we're really going to see a really high level of signaling. And this is going to help control whether proteins are made or not. We're going to look at gene regulation in two parts. First is going to be prokaryotic gene regulation. And then we're going to look in the next video at eukaryotic gene regulation. So today is just prokaryotic gene regulation. Um, what we look at when we look at a prokaryote is we do need to remember a few things. We need to remember that there is no nucleus. And usually that there is a smaller genome. Meaning there are less genes in a bacteria, a eubacteria or an archaea, than there are in the rest of the organisms, the eukaryotic organism. So you prokaryotic genes are often grouped into what we call operons that belong to the pathway which can be regulated. And this word pathway is actually really important. So we want to make sure that we remember what an enzyme pathway is. So it's usually multiple steps. of a reaction. So if we think back to glycolysis, that's a pathway. It has a series of steps that result in producing pyruvate. And each step has an enzyme. And so if we're trying to do a series of reactions, it makes sense for those enzymes to all be grouped together. Because when I need one, I probably need them all. So in prokaryotes, their genes are really organized into these functional units called an operon. And so an operon is actually going to include a couple of extra things. So an operon, as seen here, will include genes that will produce proteins. 
so the codes for proteins, but it also includes what we call a promoter region. And we already know the promoter region. This is going to attract the polymerase. Right, like the ta-ta box. This is where the transcription factors are going to assemble. But we're also going to see something called an operator. And this is a region that can be enhanced or it can be repressed. And so if we look at this picture, what we see is that basically we have this region after the main promoter region. And if something, for example, in the trip operon, if this protein binds here, it will block the RNA polymerase and we won't be able to do transcription. So this operator is really the main regulatory component. I keep these genes together because they all function to perform the same pathway. But I'm going to control whether these genes are transcribed or not, depending on if there's another molecule there. So this is kind of like our signaling molecule. It tells us no, stop, or yes, go ahead. So we're going to really see two ways. One, the molecule is going to tell us to go, meaning we've been stopped. We're not working, and we're waiting to be told to go. In this example, the first picture, we're actually stopped not doing anything, and we're waiting to be told. Um, so the trip operon is an anabolic pathway, and it is repressible. So let's look at what this means a little bit more. And so the, you're going to be given two examples of operons, and you do need to know the two examples, as well as know what it means to be a repressible pathway. So in a repressible pathway, transcription is normally occurring. Meaning the cell normally needs those enzymes for that pathway. So if we look here, the trip pathway is actually where I take something and I build tryptophan from it. But it turns out that if I have enough tryptophan, I don't want to waste my time. I don't need any more tryptophan. If I have enough, and if you remember, this is called negative feedback. If I have enough, don't make any more. So what we're going to see is that tryptophan is actually the product of these genes. I have to make these five enzymes, A, B, C, D, E, I have to make these five enzymes and then I can make tryptophan. If I have plenty of tryptophan, I don't want to waste my time doing all of this. So tryptophan will repress transcription. So normally we are making tryptophan. So that's kind of in a repressible operon we are normally functioning. And the presence of a repressor halts transcription. So in this example, normally RNA polymerase is going to be transcribing these genes as one big mRNA. If tryptophan is present, it binds to the repressor, the repressor is active, and then we repress transcription. So what we're looking at in this operon is that we're stopping transcription. So in an operon, I've got my promoter, my RNA polymerase is already bound. But what's going to happen is that in a repressible pathway, I have enough of my product, so enough product inhibits 
protein synthesis. Here, we're inhibiting protein synthesis all the way back at transcription. And this is called a repressible operon. I've got all these genes together, and if I don't need them, I can turn them off. It turns out that most building reactions are going to be repressible. I'm going to make it as long as I need to. And so that's the trip operon. So we do want to know this is an example of negative feedback. If I have enough product, I stop the reaction. And we don't just stop the enzyme reaction, we actually also stop making the enzymes. Keep in mind, we have to continuously renew things in the cell. So even though these enzymes are here and they can work multiple times, eventually they will get damaged. The next operon is basically the opposite. It's an operon that is turned off and is inducible. So an inducible can be induced. It is normally repressed. And so what we see here is that normally this is bound there. You can see how the shape will fit in there. But an inducible can be turned on by removing Repressor. So these genes are not normally made. Normally I'm repressing this reaction. But if a molecule, a signaling molecule, tells me, no, no, we need these, it binds to the repressor and it makes the repressor inactive. So we have repressible operons that are normally on and can be repressed. And we have inducible operons that are normally repressed but can be induced. And I do that by removing the repressor. So we need to know that an operon has the genes, it has the promoter, but it also has this operator region where a repressor can bind. And whether it's an inducible or repressible depends on whether the repressor is normally there. And these are usually catabolic pathways, which are breakdown which means I'm not going to make these enzymes until that thing that gets broken down is actually there. So this example is actually lactose. So for bacteria, they won't make the enzyme to break down lactose unless lactose is there. If the bacteria doesn't have any lactose, it's not going to waste time transcribing these genes and making the proteins. But if lactose appears, it turns the repressor off, and these genes can get transcribed and then translated. The final thing that we actually see in gene regulation is that not their lack of ribosomes, it's the lack of a nucleus. The lack of the nucleus allows for transcription and translation to occur almost simultaneously and for something called a polyribosome to occur. What this means is that in a eukaryotic cell, the mRNA has to leave the nucleus to get to the ribosome. But in a prokaryotic cell, there is no barrier between the DNA and the ribosomes. So what happens is as soon as mRNA is made, ribosomes attach. and begin translation. Sometimes even before transcription is done. So we actually can see the RNA polymerases still working, but the ribosomes have actually already begun to assemble the amino acids. And this is unique to prokaryotic cells. So we do need to know this concept of polyribosomes. And this means that actually many ribosomes are trans Lading at the same time. So we've got one piece of mRNA and multiple ribosomes are already working on that mRNA before it's even done being transcribed. And so this allows bacteria to have a very quick reaction.